May is Bob's birthday month, and uh, he would be 99, May 28th. And so I got to thinking about it would be good to look back and have a paper read and something about him and this paper that David is going to give, particularly the one about the Company of the Dams. Bob gave it a history conference in 1988, and uh, David also helped him research. And so David Super is our speaker today, and I have things to say about that. <laughs> Bob, <laughs> I mean, they're all good, just stay calm. Don't lie. Um, Bob was a newspaper reporter, and David was a newspaper reporter. Bob was an editor, and David was an editor. Bob was a photographer, and David is still a photographer. Bob was a historian, and David is a historian still. And he likes to say he's a storyteller, and he's a good one too. And Bob was a, re was a researcher of history, and David is also a researcher of history. Um, and, uh, and they both were proud members of the National Guard. Now, I couldn't have asked a, a nicer and better person to read Bob's papers than David Super, who would take over right now. Well, it's, it's my honor to be here today. Uh, uh, I've described my relationship with Bob as the mentor-mentee relationship that has uh, gone on uh, even before he knew that he was my mentor uh, and before I knew that I wanted to become a newspaper reporter. And I'll tell one quick story. When I was in the summer, I was in seventh or eighth grade, I was a paper boy for Morris Alec and Bob at the uh, Sturgis Tribune Black Hills Press. And in those days, the Sturgis Tribune was delivered by mail uh, during the week, and on Saturdays, the Black Hills Press in town was delivered by paper boys. Um, all boys in those days, and we were recruited out of uh, Boy Scout Troop 11, is how, we, uh, is how I got my first job in the newspaper industry. And most of my peers had they didn't stick with it, and for whatever reason, it was the only job I had. It was easy to do, um, and the routes were designed in such a way that the last paper you delivered was home. So I would walk downtown, get the papers, and walk uh, east on Main Street, and then Sherman, and zigzag uh, back and forth, and end up on Comanche Court, where we lived. Anyway, one day I was in there on Saturday waiting for the all of us paper boys were there we were waiting for the papers to be finished printed and, and counted so that we could start on, on our roots and Johnny Yeager came in the front door and I was in seventh maybe eighth grade and well, everybody in town knew who Johnny was and he came in and all of a sudden he found Bob and they went into Bob's office and they are talking and I think, geez, what's going on here? And um, the Johnny had come in with the news that Sonny Eikhoff had taken his own life. He was a city employee who was implicated in a scandal with the liquor store. And it was a long, brewing investigation and issue, and the, and the, the snare around him kept getting tighter and tighter. And finally, he, I, he must have known that, well, I'm done here. And he took his own life. Johnny came into the office with that news to Bob. And Bob went into the back. And the only time in my life I heard, stop the presses. And, you know, we all hear that myth, you know, that when something really important happened, breaking news of 1959 or 60, they stopped the printing press, took out something from the front page, Bob quickly wrote a little, a brief little story about this event that happened, and it got put into the paper, they locked it back up, started the press again, threw away the papers they had already printed, and, um, and we, we paper boys waited a little while longer, and, uh, and I, somehow that stuck in my head, like, 
oh, this is the news business. This is how it works. This is the obligation that reporters and publishers have to present news to their audience. And I've, I, I cherish that experience. And I've, I've, I know probably over the course of my lifetime, I've gotten to know thousands of reporters. I could count on maybe three fingers reporters who got to witness that same thing. Uh, a, a stop the presses moment when an event happened that was that important. And so I thank Bob for that and countless years and uh, decades of mentoring um, when I worked for Morris and Bob and then just uh, friendship and the, the planting in my head uh, the importance of history and how rich a reservoir of information that is and how, how entertaining and satisfying it is to study history, research it, write about it, uh, and have opportunities like I have today uh, to talk to you folks. Uh, our daughter is a professional historian, I think in part because of all of the talk she heard around the supper table uh, about Bob Lee and his books and his research and things like that. Even though we lived 2,000 miles apart during her growing up years, uh, she's now, a, a, and will continue for the rest of her life, as a professional historian. And since moving back home particularly, it's been my um, opportunity and privilege to work on history things for the city of Sturgis and Meade County and elsewhere. And uh, as a retired guy, I'm plenty busy. And I just hope I can keep doing this until I drop, uh, because there's that much uh, to learn and, and present and the like. So, now it's time to talk about how Sturgis came to be. And I'm going to read uh, for you two papers that Bob has uh, had written uh, about, they've been published, uh, and talking about two different topics, but the first one is, you know, the, the creation myth, the creation story for the community of Sturgis. So, it starts simply like this. Sturgis, the key city of the Black Hills, owes its birth to the frontier military assigned to protect the region's earliest settlers from Indian attack. There was no town of Sturgis until Fort Meade, the first permanent post in the Black Hills, was established one mile east of the present town in the fall of 1878. The fort site fronted a pass in the hogback ridge of the foothills that separate the open plains to the east from the heavily wooded Black Hills to the west. Its strategic location provided the key to opening the northern hills to white settlement. That's why the town, built nearly a century ago, was nicknamed the Key City. Uh, <clears throat> the first white settlers to the Black Hills were trespassers. As the region was then part of the Great Sioux Reservation, set aside for the exclusive use and occupation of the Lakota, or Western Sioux, by the Laramie Treaty of 1868. Consequently, the resentful Sioux warred on the whites illegally inventing their sacred lands after a military expedition headed by Lieutenant Colonel George A. Custer, and he discovered gold here in the Black Hills in the summer of 1874. The United States government, committed by treaty to keeping the whites out of the region, found it impossible to stem the tide of hopeful prospectors unlawfully rushing to the gold fields and creating mining camps there. So the army patrols, which, it's, which had succeeded in intercepting and turning back only a fraction of the invaders, were withdrawn while negotiations were undertaken to remove the Black Hills from the Indian Reservation. Those negotiations were not successfully completed until February 28, 1877, when the Black Hills and the roads leading to them were opened to whites. Meanwhile, Custer and the 7th Cavalry paid a high price for their role in precipitating the gold rush that resulted from their 1874 expedition into the previously unknown interior of the mysterious Black Hills. On June 25, 1876, the Sioux obtained their revenge for the unlawful invasion of their sacred lands. On that day, Custer and his men attacked the Sioux village in the Little Bighorn River Valley of Montana in an effort to force the Indians back on their reservation. Greatly outnumbered, Custer and 262 others of his command were killed in a fight and many others wounded. It was a stunning victory for the Sioux, but it also marked the beginning of the end for their long supremacy on the Northern Plains. 
During the winter of 1876-77, the government sent so many troops into the field to round up the Indians that it, that it considered hostile, um, that in, then also uh, that further resistance became futile. The cessation of the secession of the Black Hills to the whites and the surrender of Crazy Horse and his band in May of 1877 brought the Bloody Sioux War to an end. Then it became safe as well as legal for whites to travel and settle in the Black Hills. By that time, there were already dozens of towns and thousands of whites scattered along the length and breadth of the entire hills. Most of them were clustered around the booming mining camp at Deadwood in the northern hills. Thereafter, although there were only a few Indian attacks on isolated parties traveling to and from the hills and no raids on the towns there, the earliest settlers feared renewal of Indian troubles. They knew that the Sioux were resentful of the loss of their cherished Black Hills and being forced to live on reservations drastically reduced in size. The closest military posts were in Nebraska and Wyoming and along the Missouri River on the eastern edge of the reduced Sioux Reservation. Consequently, the Black Hills settlements petitioned the government for a post in the region that they felt was needed for their protection. It wasn't until the summer of 1878, however, that the government responded by sending troops to Bear Butte, an imposing landmark on the northeast fringe of the hills, to seek a suitable site for a military post for the region. The rebuilt 7th Cavalry, under the command of Colonel Samuel D. Sturgis, established a camp on Spring Creek, near the western slope of the Butte. It was named Camp Sturgis in honor of 2nd Lieutenant James G. Sturgis, son of the regiment's commander, who was among the many officers killed with Custer in the Little Bighorn fight. An infantry camp was also set up on Spring Creek, opposite the cavalry camp. The bustling mining camp at Deadwood was the largest settlement in the Black Hills at the time, and was, closest, was the closest town to the two soldier camps at Bear Butte. One of the many entrepreneurs attracted to the fast developing gold country was Jeremiah C. Wilcox of Omaha, Nebraska. He came to Deadwood in the summer of 1878 to assess the opportunities for financial success there. Wilcox was related to Colonel Sturgis's wife and upon learning that the Colonel was with his troops at Bear Butte, he went there to visit him. Wilcox proposed that a town be established closer to the likely site of the new post than Deadwood, which was 14 miles to the west. He invited Colonel Sturgis and other officers of the 7th Cavalry to become partners in the town site company that he founded to plat the new town. The number of lots allotted to the company members depended on the amount of their investments. The investors realized their profits by selling the lots to persons desiring to live near the new post or do business with it. A number of officers, including Colonel Sturgis, invested in the enterprise. Try that today in the Army, the Air Force, or the Marine Corps. But not to say that it doesn't go on one way or another, but uh, these guys were open and above board. Uh, they were active duty military personnel, and they invested in the town site. Consequently, in the early morning of August 26, 1878, Wilcox staked out the town site of Sturgis, a short distance west of the pass in the foothills leading to the open plains and the soldiers' camp at Bear Butte. Unlike Camp Sturgis, the new town was named for Colonel Sturgis, not his son. Wilcox filed the 40-acre townsite plat at the land office at Deadwood using Valentine's script to pay the fee. Meanwhile, the troops at the Bear Butte camps provided protection for the mining settlements and escort services for army officers seeking the best location for a military post in the area. Spearfish and Rabbit Valleys were scouted as prospect prospective sites, but it was General Phil Sheridan himself who made the final decision. The Civil War hero, then in command of a military division that included Dakota Territory, picked the area just outside the eastern end of the pass that served as the gateway to the northern hills. Sheridan's site selection was just one mile east of the new town of Sturgis City. It had the additional advantage of being in the path of Sioux traveling to and from their reservation to unseated hunting grounds to the west. 
That made it easier for the Army to keep careful watch on the Indian movements. Fortuitously, the stage and wagon trains from the Missouri River, River supply points at Bismarck and Fort Pier, along with the trail from Sydney, Nebraska to the hills, all converged at Sturgis City. That made the new community a key transportation hub, as well as a valuable provider of needed services to the developing nearby military post. With a permanent post site selected, part of the troops camped at Bear Butte and were moved five miles to the southwest to begin work on the new fort. The construction camps on the banks of Bear Butte Creek was named Camp Rulin for First Lieutenant George Rulin, the quartermaster officer in charge of, build, of the building activity. He employed a sizable force of civilian workers to assist the soldiers in constructing the first buildings of the new facility. The first barracks buildings were occupied in December, and on the last day of 1878, the War Department designated the post Fort Meade. It was named in memory of General George G. Meade, another Civil War hero who had died in 1872. Completion of the fort and closing of the soldier camps at Bear Butte also ended the brief existence of Scoop Town. This was the shantily, the shanty town hurriedly set up near the Butte shortly after the soldiers first bivouacked there. It was started by Grasshopper Jim Frederick to provide entertainment for the soldiers during their off-duty time. Frederick had squatted at the site of Scoop Town prior to the opening of the Black Hills for a settlement. He had homesteaded there when settlements were later legalized. The cluster of tents and shanties housed gamblers, whiskey dealers, and sporting girls from Deadwood, whose sole mission was to scoop the pockets of soldiers following their pay payday. Sturgis City inherited the sobriquet of Scoop Town when Frederick's resort went out of existence and the new town became the principal place where the soldiers spent their pay in memory of Frederick's infamous short-lived venture, the town's high school athletic teams adopted the name Scoopers and are still known by that term today. Fort Meade became a 10-company post in early 1879, and troops of the 7th Cavalry were assigned to garrison it. Colonel Sturgis became a vigorous booster of the adjacent town, named for him, and proposed and prospered richly from the sale of lots in what became known as the Fort Meade addition to the town. He was an active participant in the early development of the Black Hills, becoming president of both mining and oil enterprises. He retired at Fort Meade on June 11, 1886, at age 65, after 40 years of outstanding service to his country. An equestrian statue of him graces City Park that lies between the town and Fort Meade. The 7th Cavalry remained, remained at Fort Meade until the summer of 1888, when it was transferred to posts in Kansas. And those of you that might have at home a copy of the centennial edition of the Sturgis Tribune of Black Hills Press that was published in 1978 uh, will remember this as the opening page, the opening headline of uh, more than 100 pages of uh, stories and information about the creation of the town and a kind of status report of what Sturgis was like in 1978. And it was Bob's idea to create this and with Morris's support and the day-to-day -day assistance of a young uh, University of South Dakota graduate named Penny Rogers Leonard, uh, who was the principal reporter assigned to assist Bob with writing the stories and all, why this publication was run off the presses. They didn't stop it. I think once it got started, it rolled until they were done. Um, and there are copies everywhere. I, I have two copies at home, and I'm not giving them up for anything, and uh, they're in the library, and perhaps some of you here in the room have your own copies that you have saved. So, anyway, can you continue back with uh, Bob's uh, uh, manuscript here? Wilcox was listed as a real estate agent in the first federal census of Sturgis City in 1880 when the community had a total of 60 residents, including three saloon keepers. City was dropped from the town's name in the early 1880s. An additional 40 residents were counted in, in the Sturgis City voting precinct, and that included the outskirts of the town. But Fort Meade had a population of 522 in 1880, including 141 civilian employees. Wilcox served as postmaster of Sturgis, 
from 1879 to 1882. Then he returned to Omaha, where he also had extensive real estate holdings. The lifespan of most frontier military posts averaged 22 years, but Fort Meade remained a military establishment for 66 years. It was garrisoned by the cavalry and infantry regiments for most of its existence. It could credit its long life to the important role it played in keeping peace on the Dakota frontier and to the strong support it received from the townspeople of Sturgis. The 4th Cavalry served at Fort Meade the longest, 25 years, in two separate tours of duty. It was the last horse outfit stationed there and it was converted to a mechanized force at the outbreak of World War II. An infantry glider regiment and an engineer service company were the last units to serve there prior to the transfer of the facility to the Veterans Administration for hospital purposes in, 18, in 1944. Fort Meade had been home to a civilian conservation corps camp for several years prior to World War II. It was situated on the western edge of the military reservation and named Camp Fletchner for Robert Fletchner, the national director of the CCC program. The fort also housed a prisoner of war camp during the war. The German and Italian prisoners detained there helped to convert old army barracks into hospital wards for the VA prior to their repatriation after the war. The VA subsequently built an entirely new and modernized hospital complex north of the former army buildings. The old post is now listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Over the many years of the fort's existence, it maintained a close relationship to the town of Sturgis and its establishment uh, had, and the, the creation of the town. The town also developed a major trade center for the vast agricultural sector of northwestern South Dakota. The farmers and ranchers of Bear Butte and Alkali Valleys especially provided horses, hay, and foodstuffs to the fort during its many years of, as an active duty military facility. The symbiotic relationship between Fort Meade and Sturgis has continued under VA management of the longtime federal establishment. It employs a considerable number of Sturgis residents as well as citizens of other Black Hills communities. It also provides valuable medical services to the veterans of this region and ranks high in the VA's Black Hills health care system. The relationship between Fort Meade and Sturgis, as Bob was writing this paper, and I was living in the Washington, D.C. area at the time, and he asked me to help him do some research, and I was able to go to the archives and hold in my hands letters signed by the Davenports and other important people in Sturgis uh, pleading with the Department of the Army and the Secretary of War to keep Fort Meade open. You know, we think that the, the political fracas at Ellsworth Air Force Base of about 10 years ago or so when the base was on the list to be closed and then, you know, the heavens moved and the stars aligned and who knows what other promises were made and all of a sudden Ellsworth is back in business again. Well, the, 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 uh, the town founders of Sturgis, the important people here in town, didn't want to see Fort Meade closed in the 1920s and thereabouts. And you could go to the archives and you could see these letters written attesting to the good hay, the ample water, the relationship between the town and the post and the like, and you know, please keep it open. And those pleas were heard, and the fort did last way longer uh, than all the other frontier forts that are out here in the West. So back to Bob's story. Uh, fort Meade has had a long and interesting history, and it has seen many fascinating personalities, and co personalities come and go over the years. So has the community that came to life nearby when the post was first established. Among the historical characters who at one time called Sturgis their home was Annie Talent, the first white woman to come to the hills prior to their legal opening. She returned to the hills after being evicted from them by the Army in 1875 and died in Sturgis in 1901 after serving as a pioneer teacher and school superintendent in the region. In addition to Grasshopper Jim Frederick, who spent his last years as a Sturgis resident, other notable pioneer characters of the town included Poker Alice Tubbs and Calamity Jane Burke. Poker Alice, a cigar-smoking cart shark who liked to dress in army khaki, 
operated a gaming house between Sturgis and Fort Meade that catered to the soldier trade. She was arrested numerous times for keeping a disorderly house, and only a pardon from the governor saved her from the state penitentiary. <laughs> Calamity Jane managed to get around to all of the towns in the Black Hills, and at some point during her long and troubled career, she was in Sturgis. The newspapers frequent, frequently reported her on her boisterous presence in the town and at Fort Meade. Many other more respectable but less colorful citizens left their marks on the histories of both Fort Meade and Sturgis. The contributions of these pioneers to the progress of both entities were substantial and long-lasting. They are remembered with pride, admiration, and gratitude. Appropriately, the fine relationship that has long existed between Fort Meade and Sturgis is now celebrated in Cavalry Days every June, which sadly doesn't go on anymore, but who knows, it could be revived. It is uh, this year. It will it this is. year. Okay, well, that's what I get for not living here at home. Uh, its events recreate much of the unique history that has linked the fort to the town for well over a century. The celebration has gained popularity with every passing year, and this year's event promises to be the best ever. The Cavalry Days Committee has worked hard to develop a program of entertainment and, his and historical interest that will assure a memorable experience for all. So don't miss it. Thus ends the story that Bob wrote to uh, talk about the how Sturgis came to be, that relationship between Fort Meade, and even before Fort Meade, but when the Department of the Army was here, first, first as this protective force for the settlers that came, and, the, and the, the gold miners that came, and then how that evolved into the community. Uh, there's you, further milestones in the history of the town would certainly be in the election in 1888-87 uh, that separated um, Meade County away from Lawrence County, uh, thus establishing Sturgis as the county seat. Tilford was in the running for that designation, but uh, they lost badly in the election that was held, and uh, Sturgis ends up as the county seat. Um, the far northeastern part of the county, there, were, there was the county of Delano and Scobie that existed for short periods of time, but they got absorbed and consolidated into Meade County. Uh, so that certainly was an important milestone uh, for the community of Sturgis to be declared as the county seat of Meade County. Um, the addition of the railroad here, um, and then other milestones, um, and 78, 9, whatever years ago, the motorcycle route. Uh, that for us old timers, we kind of always say that with our teeth clenched a little bit, but nonetheless, the rally is an institution here in the town and the region uh, that can't be dismissed or overlooked as a, another milestone uh, depending on your point of view, better or worse, uh, for the community and its, uh, its evolution into the 21st century and what we see and appreciate from living here, being here, traveling here today. So that's story number one. Story number two is also connected to Fort Meade. It's one that I had the privilege of helping Bob research. Um, and it's one of these mysterious stories about Fort Meade that uh, folks know about, but the details get lost because it's a complicated story uh, that lived, the flame of this story existed here for a relatively short period of time, uh, but nonetheless uh, has made its mark in history. And Bob uh, researched this story, as have other historians and writers. Uh, and presented this, his findings in a paper that he read at the 20th Annual Dakota State College History Conference in Madison, South Dakota, in 1988. So, uh, the things that are in this story, bear in mind, this research was done in the mid-1980s, the writing done in 87 and 88, and the story presented then in 1988. Uh, now we've advanced the clock of 30 plus years uh, and so 
the story isn't dated necessarily, but just bear in mind that it reflects the, the viewpoints and the knowledge that historians like Bob and others had 30 years ago. And if you were to write the story today, um, it'd be longer and uh, more, more nuanced with other things that have evolved from this period of time. So this is the story of several military organizations that came to be known as the Companies of the Damned. And they were US military organizations and here's what Bob found out and has had to say about them. The year was 1940 and Hitler was running amok in Europe. The march of the Nazi stormtroopers into Czechoslovakia and Poland the previous year and into France and the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, neutral Denmark and Norway in the spring of 1940 finally convinced the United States Congress that World War II was in the making. Great Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the Union of South Africa had already declared war on Hitler's Germany. But the Neutrality Act of 1937 prevented the United States from intervening in the war already underway in Europe. It did not, however, prevent increased attention to the, appeal, uh, to the appeals of the U.S. military for a fast buildup of its forces in preparation for war that would soon force American involvement. By the middle of June 1940, the regular Army's authorized strength had been increased to 370,000. That compared with only 227,000 the previous summer. Increases in manpower and weaponry were also, also authorized for other branches of the American Armed Services. By the end of August, Congress had authorized mobilization of the National Guard and six weeks later, the first conscription law ever, in, in fact, ever enacted while the United States was at peace went into effect. The Selective Service and Training Act of 1940 provided for the induction of 900,000 men between the ages of 21 and 36. More than 16 and a half million men were re registered in accordance with this law in October and the first conscripts, officially described as selectees, but better known as draftees, were called up the following month. By the summer of 1941, the Army strength had increased to 1.5 million. Those had come, who had come into the Army through the National Guard and selective service programs, however, could not be required to serve anywhere outside the Western Hemisphere or for more than 12 months within the continental limits of the United States. Consequently, in the summer of 1941, the Army could only feebly reinforce its overseas garrisons. Uh, and I'll, I'll break here for a minute just to plant another little reminder in your head. So, the war is brewing in Europe. Japan looks like something's going to happen there. The politicians in the United States were reluctant to get involved for various reasons, and but nonetheless it eventually just became an inev inevitable that the U.S. military had to get bigger in 1940. And so it did with the, the uh, draft law that was enacted, the activation of all of the National Guard units in the nation, including the unit here in Sturgis, and really all of South Dakota, the entire nation, got called to active duty. But the time period was for one year. That was the political compromise that was created. And there was a popular song written uh, during that time, and the, the opening line was, goodbye dear, I'll be back in a year. And that was the little sop that was thrown out to the civilian world that, uh, yeah, this war stuff, that's for Europe, we're not gonna get involved, but we gotta get a little stronger here. We'll call up the National Guard and we'll draft a whole bunch of people, but we'll set the time limit at one year, and oh, by the way, they can't leave the Western Hemisphere. And so uh, a songwriter wrote the tune, Goodbye Dear, I'll Be Back in a Year. Um, and it, it wasn't a top 40 hit, but nonetheless, it, uh, uh, it spoke to the political uh, atmosphere of the time and the reluctance of the nation to get involved in what, looks, what was looking like another world war. So, 
And among the draftees was Bob Lee, uh, who had joined the military in advance of that. He wanted to start the clock on his one year so that he could serve his, his 12 months of active duty, be discharged, and go back home to Minneapolis and start his, his true love, his true life, as a newspaper reporter. Uh, he, along with thousands and thousands of other men, uh, can play that gamble of do I join now or do I wait until I'm called? And so Bob and thousands of others joined uh, at the moment thinking that, well, I'll be home in a year. And it, for Bob and others, it didn't quite work out that way. So the military establishment, and in that draft sweep of all of the people that were called up, uh, it was the cats and dogs and the athletes and the smart people and the dumb people and it, everybody. I mean, that was a pretty wide net that the draft went out and scooped up in that first conscription. And military planners and organizers had to struggle with, along with all of these physically fit, dedicated patriots, people who are going to be good soldiers, we know we're going to catch some, some duds along the way. And what do we do with them? Do we kick them out? Do we allow them to just raise their hand and say, you know, I'm, I'm not cut out to be a soldier. I want to go home. Uh, the policymakers had a real struggle uh, with how to manage this. And so decisions were made to, uh, and, and as Bob writes, and I'll, I'll start back into his manuscript in just a second, but just to set the stage, decisions were made that, well, they're drafted, they're drafted. We're taking them in. We can't allow this easy excuse for people to just say, eh, I don't want to be a soldier. Send me home. Um, and so, uh, but once in the military, then what do you do with these men? Uh, do you put them in a frontline infantry outfit or do you do something else with them? If they misbehave, once we get them in active, on active duty, we have the Uniform Code of Military Justice we have military law that can take care of any mischief or misbehavior uh, that, that they exhibit. But we, we've got to take them in. We can't allow this easy backdoor excuse for people. So the military establishment had no difficulty dealing with persons who performed acts of disloyalty after they entered the service. There were the Articles of War, which allowed it to try such persons by courts martial and provided for their punishment upon conviction. The problem was with those whose loyalty was suspect either because of their activities prior to enlisting or being drafted or their attitude while in service. And possessing an unsatisfactory attitude toward military service, especially among draftees prior to the bombing of Pearl Harbor, was not uncommon among the soldiers of the peacetime army. In some cases, these attitudes didn't change with the active involvement of the United States in the war either. Unless they committed overt acts of disloyalty, however, the military had no way of dealing with such persons. Compl complaints of such persons existing within the various army units began reaching the Secretary of War in 1942. An army-wide survey indicated there were about 1,500 men so classified including an estimated 1,000 Germans, 150 Japanese, and the remainder of Italians or other soldiers with European backgrounds. Not knowing what else to do with them, the secretary decided that it would be best to segregate these soldiers in special organizations that would be given duties unrelated directly to war. Consequently, in 1942, within six months of the declaration of war, Secretary Sim Stimson issued the following confidential order, quoting the, the Secretary's document, in cases concerning enlisted personnel, whether citizens or alien, who are definitely suspected of subversive activity or disloyalty, even though investigation has failed to uncover specific evidence in justification of this suspicion, the subjects will be assigned to organizations where duties of a harmless character will be given to them. The order was confidential for obvious reasons. It was a blatant violation of the civil rights of those so assigned 
since they had not been proven guilty of any subversive or disloyal activity. This was the pre-McCarthy McCarthy era, when everyone was presumed to be innocent until they were proven guilty under the American jurisprudence system. The principle applied even to those in the military under the provisions of the Article of War. Nevertheless, the order was quickly implemented and on July 31st, the first of these special organizations was activated as a quartermaster service company. It was staffed by an officer and non-commissioned officer cadre of unquestioned loyalty. It was filled out with enlisted men fitting the description outlined in the order and recommended for assignment to it, uh, to it by their commanding officer through the War Department's general staff. So a big chain of command, a big uh, long string of things that had to happen. Uh, exactly how many companies of a similar nature were formed is not known since they were created by orders marked secret. These orders were not declassified until after World War II. It is known, however, that at least three such companies were activated during 1942. They've been identified as the 358th Quartermaster General Services Company and the 525th and the 620th Engineer General Service Companies. They were, to get to the, to get to the title of this paper at long last, the Companies of the Damned. These companies were unique for two reasons. First, because of their unusual nature, and secondly, because there were so few of them during, in the entire army. Up to VJ Day in 1945, between 1,200 and 1,500 soldiers served in these three outfits. If there were other companies like them, their identities have not yet been disclosed. It was reported that soldiers assigned to these companies had two things in common. First, there was no proof that they had committed any subversive acts after their induction. For if they, if they had, they would have been court-martialed. And secondly, all of them had in intelligence files alleging that they had said or done something subversive prior to their induction. So these were people who were suspect from the day that they were, that they raised their hand and were uh, sworn the oath and brought into the military. But they hadn't done anything technically wrong. So, the 385th Quartermaster and the 620th Engineer General Services Companies were composed principally of men of, of men of German or Italian extraction, while the 525th was made up of mainly of American Japanese soldiers. The 358th was stationed at Camp Carson, Colorado, and the 525th at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. The third company, the 620th, with an authorized strength of five officers and 176 enlisted men, was activated at Fort Meade, South Dakota on November 1st, 1942. And we will focus on this company for the remainder of the presentation. This fuzzy picture that I apologize for is of what camp, the site of Camp Fetchner looks like today. So west of Fort Meade, just as you come into the entrance of Fort Meade, the land um, there the, to the south was the location of the CCC camp which had closed and had gone dormant by the time World War II started. And so the 620th uh, Engineer Company comes to Fort Meade, a, an outfit full of suspected characters, and the Army didn't want to put them in the regular post, in the regular barracks, so I know what we'll do. We'll put them out at the old CCC camp. And so that's where they were stationed, and that was their they slept and ate there and performed their duties largely from that set of uh, temporary wooden buildings. The 620th Engineer Company was really an international outfit. While most of its members were native-born American citizens of foreign descent, the company roster included, beside the Germans and Italians, a Finn, a Dane, a Hungarian, a Yugoslav, and a white Russian. A substantial majority of its members or of the right-wing persu persuasion, and the minority was said to be as far off to the left, including a German-born communist. Several of the Germans were former seamen who had been inducted into the U.S. military while awaiting deportation hearings. Others were considered nonconformists who simply refused to fight against any of the nations, Germany, Italy, or Japan. Um, these men were issued no arms, received no, practically no military training, 
and were restricted to service within the continental limits of the United States and assigned to non-sensitive duties. At Fort Meade, members of the 620th made camouflage nets, planted trees, painted barracks, collected garbage, and performed similar menial tasks. Like the rest of the garrison, they were permitted to leave the post during their off-duty hours. They were on active duty in the U.S. Army. They were soldiers. There was nothing to distinguish them from the other sto soldiers stationed at Fort Meade, so nobody in the nearby town of Sturgis knew of their special military status. This information was also carefully kept from the rest of the garrison to prevent, prevent friction between the units. It's prob it probably wasn't hard to do since the garrison had been greatly reduced by the, the, what was going on in the war at the time. Besides, the headquarters of 620th was the old two-story buildings formerly used by the CCC. So little was known locally about the 620th. In fact, that some of the members managed to rent, managed to rent an apartment in Deadwood for their off-duty carousing. A group of them also rented a cabin in Spearfish Canyon during the summer of 1943. The cabin was bugged by the Army's counterintelligence agents in the expectation that these soldiers were planning some subversive activity in the vicinity. But all the illegal activity revealed by the prolonged surveillance was the fact that some of the soldiers had broken the state's fishing laws. <laughs> um, here you are. You're not going to get court-martialed, but the game, game warden's going to put you in jail. And so, uh, uh, but it speaks to the time of uh, what it was like here in, in Sturgis and at Fort Meade. And you have this outfit out at the fort that nobody knew very much about. And uh, these are young men, after all, and they've got a little money in their pocket because they're earning regular army wages and uh, time off, the weekends and the like. Hey, boys, let's go to Deadwood. And so, uh, and when they got tired of that, you know, renting a cabin in Spearfish Canyon. Uh, it's a nice place, you know, why not go there to go fishing, so. So, um, representative, but not typical, of the enlisted men in the 620th were four soldiers who got into serious trouble after the unit left Fort Meade. Private First Class Friedrich Wilhelm Searling was a former German merchant seaman who had entered the United States illegally in 1936 by jumping ship in New York. He'd been drafted while he was awaiting a deportation hearing, but the proceedings were dropped when the war was declared against his native country. Although the Selective Service Act permitted it, the 1907 Hague International Peace Conference prohibited the drafting of nationals to fight against their own countries. The Army wasn't certain about Searling's loyalties, so he was assigned to the 620th. Then there was Private Theophil Leonhard, who was born in Germany and had been brought to the United States by his parents when he was nine years old. He was a graduate of Southwestern University in Texas and was employed, employed as an assistant in the Department of Government at the University of Texas, where he'd received a master's degree when he was drafted. He was known to be strongly pro-Nazi and signed his letters with Heil Hitler. He had been closely associated with the head of the German-American Bund and had even been interviewed by the Un-American Activities Committee. He claimed that his interest in Hitler was more or less academic, but he went into the 620th nonetheless. And then there was Paul Kissman, born in Erie, Pennsylvania. He was a German ancestry and lived in Germany in 1939 and 40, where he had become indoctrinated with Nazism. His allegiance was also suspect, and he too was assigned to the 620th. And the barracks were full of people like that. One more makes up this quartet that Bob writes about. By far the most interesting and controversial member of the 620th was Private First Class Dale Maple, who had, born, who had been born in San Diego in 1920. His parents were also American-born, and their ancestry was English and Irish. Maple, a classic pianist who had given his first concert at the age of 13, graduated first in his high school class of 585 and was awarded a scholarship to Harvard where he graduated magna cum laude in 1941. He specialized in comparative philology. I took 
me a while to learn how to pronounce that word. The science of linguistics. He could speak several lang foreign languages fluently, including German. The FBI had a considerable file on him by the time of his graduation from college. He had been expelled from the ROTC program at Harvard because of his pro-Nazi views and had resigned from the university's German club because of its criticism of Hitler and his ideals that even a dictatorship, a bad dictatorship, Mabel declared, is better than a good democracy. In December 1941, while doing graduate work at Harvard, Maple attempted to go to Germany and join its army. When that failed, he joined the American army, and his motives were immediately and understandably suspect. When the 88th Glider Infantry left Fort Meade in November of 1943, the 620th Engineer General Services Company was the only remaining unit on post. Plans were made to abandon the fort and convert it to a Veterans Administration hospital. Consequently, in December, the 620th was transferred to Camp Hale, Colorado. Uh, there was a German prisoner of war camp there, and all four of the 620th members, these four guys that I've named, um, became involved in the escape of two German prisoners. In fact, Maple, the ringleader of the escape plot, was captured with two prisoners near the Mexican border. He was court-martialed for desertion under the 58th Article of War and for aiding the enemy during wartime under the 81st Article of War. Here's a picture of Maple and uh, what happened to him. He was found guilty on both charges and became the first ever American soldier to be convicted under the military equivalent of treason. Maple was sentenced to be hanged, but unlike Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, who were convicted and executed under the civil law for treason after World War II, he escaped the gallows. President Franklin Roosevelt commuted his sentence to life imprisonment. Maple, who was described as having an IQ of 153, taught language skills in the federal penitentiary at Leavenworth, Kansas, and paroled until he was paroled in 1950. For their lesser roles in the escape plot, the three other men, guys that all lived here at Fort Meade, um, were given were also tried by court-martial. Both Leonard, or Leonhard and Kinsman were sentenced to life in prison, but their terms were later reduced to 10 and eight years respectively. Uh, Leonhard received no further clemency and served out his sentence at Leavenworth. Kinsman was paroled in February 1947. Searling was sentenced to five years in the Army Rehabilitation Center, but was, was released earlier and moved to Argentina. By orders of the Secretary of War, these courts martial proceedings were classified as secret. That was because the government did not want the public to know about their existence of these special organizations. Formed among the, formed among the army's loyalties, uh, formed by the members of these people who were suspect. All four defendants who had come from the 620th and uh, widespread, widespread publicity about their trials would certainly have exposed the existence of these special units. Civil rights lawyers and organizations would have had a field day, even in the 1940s. In February 1944, the 620th was disbanded at Camp Hale and reorganized with its sister companies, the 358th and the 525th, as part of an Engineer General Services Battalion. The former 620th became Company A, and it wasn't until after World War II that the records of these Companies of the Damned were declassified and their secret nature exposed. The 620th was the last company size unit stationed at Fort Meade before its abandonment as a military installation. Ironically, it became the site of a branch German POW camp after the 620th had left Camp Hale. The German prisoners at Fort Meade, assigned from the main camp at Fort Robinson, were guarded by a small military, military police detachment. The prisoners' main work was to aid in the conversion of the old army buildings into hospital wards. Fort Meade had garrisoned many of the army's most respected and decorated units during its 66 years as an active military post. But the 620th Engineer General Services Company, the most notorious of the little-known companies of the damned, was not among them. It was an inappropriate inappropriate ending for a post with Fort Meade's distinguished record. 
The monthly magazines of American Legion and the Veterans of Foreign Wars carried columns of notices about reunions of numerous military units. You'll search them in vain, however, for any reunions of the 6th, 20th, and now you know why. That ends Bob's paper. Uh, since Bob's paper was written, an author by the last name of Herbert has written this book, and I've got a copy of it here somewhere. It's a very small kind of, kind of a glorified pamphlet, actually. And this author goes into great detail about what happened to the four guys that were in the 620th living here at Sturgis or at Fort Meade when they subsequently went to Camp Hale, Colorado, and they organized this breakout of German POWs. Um, and Maple was the ringleader of that. Um, he had a car, an old Rio car, somehow, and they were, that was their getaway car. And so he and two German prisoners um, finally managed to get out of the, the front gates of Camp Hale, headed for Mexico. I mean, these guys were out of here. They, they didn't want to stay in the United States. They wanted to go to Germany. They were going to fight for the German army. Um, they, they had car trouble, uh, all kinds of difficulties. They get to the Mexican border. They get across the border a few miles and they ran out of gas. And I, I can, you can only imagine, and, and this author and some other things that I have read talks about, well, they knew they were across the border. So all we really have to do is just go to City Hall, some little Mexican village, and tell the authorities there that, hey, we made it. Can you get us to Argentina? And then we're going to go from Argentina back to Berlin and we're going to fight for the fatherland. The local Mexican cops picked these guys up, arrested them, called the U.S. authorities. Hey, we got these American soldiers and, and two guys that maybe are German, but we're not sure. We picked them up. We're just going to give them back to you. And so they, <laughs> the Mexicans just drove them back across the border, handed them off, and... Uh, you know, their, their fate was sealed after that. Um, so the, the irony of this grand scheme, you know, worthy of some kind of a movie or maybe a full novel or something like that, ends up with a, just a local, you know, policeman uh, in Mexico doing his duty. Then we don't want these guys here. They're yours. And they handed them back. So that's the 620th. Um, when I went to work in Washington, D.C. in the early 1980s, uh, I had the good fortune of spending time with some professional military historians. We all worked in the same big room. And uh, I started asking questions about this because Bob had called and written to me asking for help with research. And right away, one of the gents, uh, a Ukrainian-American uh, nonetheless, uh, said, Oh, yeah, I know about those. And so he started to tell me about them. And uh, there's been, there's really quite a bit of writing that has been done about uh, these. And in the bibliography of this little book, there's Bob Lee's book about Fort Meade cited as one of the references that this author used to write his story. So the, the legacy of how historians help each other uh, is certainly demonstrated by something like this. Uh, we've run out of time. I want to ask those of you that are here today, um, how many of you have knowledge of the 620th? Not a soul, okay. Uh, and and I, I'm not surprised by that. I mean, there were, the war was, the World War II was a big and complex thing that involved the entire nation uh, top to bottom, front to back, uh, and it was a very complex uh, operation that touched everyone in the nation. There was more than 16 million people were on active duty through the course of the war. Uh, everybody had a spouse, a close family member, a friend, a classmate, uh, a buddy, somebody who was involved in the war effort. And so just the, the overall under the civilian understanding of things and the way 
the protocols and the way work was done then um, was different uh, compared to today when it's, uh, if you're in, in the military, active duty or guard or reserve, you're within about a 1% of the entire 330 million people that are in the United States. So the level of, of understanding and comprehension is dramatically diminished in the 21st century compared to what it was in the 1940s. Uh, and right here in Sturgis, because of the relationship with Fort Meade, first as an, as an active duty post, and then by 1944, as it transitioned to becoming a VA hospital, um, and ironically, the 620th, this, this company of misfits, uh, is the last, they, I don't think they performed the ceremony, but you could say, uh, symbolically, they were the last, they were the last unit at the fort. They took down the flag. You know, the irony of that, of uh, all these cavalry soldiers that had been there for 66 years, the glider troops, uh, the other people that have had come and gone, and uh, who gets to turn out the lights but a bunch of people that want to go to Mexico and escape to Germany. You know, uh, and uh, it's the way stuff happens. And so, uh, and now, if you go to Fort Meade and you see how the military has returned to the garrison uh, in, in the, uh, the way that the Regional Training Institute operates from there, um, it's, it still continues in service for veterans and for service members. Uh, the, this book, Treason in the Rockies, I bought it for three bucks on Amazon. It's not a bestseller. Uh, but it was published very recently. Uh, it, it's a reasonable read if you like history. Um, I recommend it to folks if you've got three bucks to spend or four or five, whatever you can buy a copy for. This one's used. Um, uh, signed, and it's signed inside by the, by the author's mother, who was sent it to a newspaper in Colorado, um, urging them to review the book and write, write a story about the publication of the book. And I presume that maybe the newspaper did that, and then put this in the used books pile real quick, and that's how I bought it from Amazon. So, um, but we have our mothers to thank, because they're always looking out for us in uh, one way or another. So. Uh, Others, in, does anyone have a story about their family's experiences in the World War II era Fort Meade? You know, I didn't move here until 1954 and I was a little kid, uh, but I could only kind of fantasize of what it must have been like uh, when the cavalry left in the early 40s, uh, when it was still a vigorous post with a bugle played every day and they put the flag up on the staff and it was yes sir, no sir, uh, I better get this horse cleaned or this truck washed before Sergeant Smith gets me. Uh, and it's Friday night, well boys, let's go to Deadwood. And uh, you know, all of that lifestyle of what the fort was like has uh, always been, yes, go ahead. I have a Stop the Presses story. Ah, please. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a Stop the Presses story that was when I was 19 years old, I went to work for the Rapid City Journal. And I was there uh, during World War II. And uh, I was working in the front office one day when Cliff Edwards, the editor of the newspaper, came running down the stairs as fast as he could go and headed back to the press room. Well, you know, something was up. I didn't know. The phone rang and somebody said, is it true that President Roosevelt died? And I said, I don't know of that for sure, but something's going on. And of course, that's what it was. Cliff Edwards went back, stopped the presses. <laughs> they, saw, they did their late edition at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. They stopped the presses and, and converted it to the death of the President of the United States. So I answered the phone for a long time. Yes, it's true. Yes, it's true. Pretty soon it was. Why don't I have my paper? Why don't I have my paper? And it was just fascinating. I stayed there until, you know, it was very late. I just stayed and my boss said, you just stayed. I said, I couldn't have gone home for anything. But that was a true stop the press story. 
Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I've just been kind of looking into my dad's military history, and he was assigned at Fort Meade, and I've got his ID tags, and if you look at those, you can tell someone when someone was drafted, because the first number is either three or four. Well, he was drafted, and he couldn't have been drafted. He, I have a picture of his outfit at Fort Meade in 19, July 1941. So it was in F Troop, which mm -hmm. meant different things at that time than it does now. <laughs> but, um, so he had to have been in this crew that was drafted right after, right in October, November mm -hmm. of 1940, and was, I imagine they had a uh, boot camp there somehow. And he was in the CCC before that, so he was kind of militarized a little bit ahead of time. And I'm trying to trace back that information about how people who were in the CCCs got uh, into the Army and whether there was any direct route for that or not. But, but, um, but he, was, he was one of the people that was drafted at that, you know, just like that. And, and you can imagine in that first wave, and like Bob writes in his paper, that the 100% of the National Guard's called out and a whole bunch of men are drafted for that one year, you know. And so you go on active duty, man, you don't want to be there. You're in college. You're going to get married. You were working on the farm. You had a job uh, or something like that. And gee, I'm, now I'm in the Army. Uh, that must have been a leadership challenge for the officers and, and NCOs of the active duty Army to almost overnight almost have thousands of men, young, fit, not entirely ungrumpy uh, about their situation to be there and to, to mold those young people into soldiers and, and win the war. That, that was complicated and a, a real study. Yes. Well, the other half of that might have been this group of people that were sort of disenfranchised by the, uh, by the depression and were making a buck a day in uh, CCC camps that, I mean, if you look at that, I don't know specifically, but there's a saying that the Depression never really ended. There, you know, the, the programs that were in place, CCCs, WPA, those things didn't, didn't end the Depression. What ended the Depression was World War II. And, and the impact on, on the young men in, in the community. I, I remember talking to a woman who's uncle was one of those early draftees in that first wave before before Pearl Harbor and he gets to basic training or the equivalent of it in those days and then uh, privates that were inducted into the army were issued two pairs of shoes and this this uncle years and years later said that two pair of shoes right. he put one pair on and that was for the shoes that he wore. He mailed the other pair home. Because <laughs> after his year was over, he thought, uh, I'm gonna have another pair of shoes that I haven't had to pay for. You know, that's how that's how grim it must have been or, or lean it was in uh, American family life. Uh, there was a, um, you know, you, you hear people write, Kil Kilroy was here, you know, yes. places. Well, at, at, during this time, people would write, I'm Ohio. I'm over the hill in October. Yes? Well, I was born in Idaho. Um, my dad um, ended up there. He was an immigrant from Germany. Um, he, my grandpa came over and was going to settle in Minnesota and buy a farm. But something happened on the way about a year later when the family was supposed to come over, and that was called World War I. Mm. And so my grandpa didn't find the family until 1924, and then by the, the Red Cross and brought them over. But anyway, they were in Idaho, and of course my dad had very broken English, and um, he, didn't, he was afraid he was drafted twice, but he managed to get out of it the, the first time, and the second time he went to work for the Sunshine Mine. Well, number one, I mean, it, it's lead and silver. They produced all of Iran's coin, plus all the 
or Saudi Arabia's, mm -hmm. plus all of the um, metal needed for armament. So my dad worked in the Sunshine Mine for the remainder of World War II, and that's that section, but that's what my dad did. Mm -hmm. He never he never did go to work. He was afraid he would get interned. And what is it talked about in the book that was written and in the research that I have done, and I haven't, I'm nowhere near, I've just put my toe in the water on this topic, is how the, the military establishment of the 1940s, what kind of a mechanism did they have to screen the draftees? Uh, and in a place like South Dakota, uh, there were plenty of young men who were U.S. citizens uh, born in the 19 teens and 20s who get drafted in 1940 who worshipped in a German speaking church and their parents read German newspapers <coughs> and all of that and all of a sudden you're in the army and you're at Fort Haystack somewhere and you know was there a, was there a mechanism there <coughs> that said Fritz is okay uh, Send him into the infantry. He's going to be a good soldier. He's a loyal patriot. Yeah, he's got a German accent, but so do a whole bunch of other people. But this Don Maples guy, this Harvard grad, uh, he's weird. We don't want him in the 101st Airborne. We're going to put him in Fort Meade, chopping firewood, painting the fence, or whatever. Somebody had to make that decision. And you know, what was the mechanism that did that? Uh, and knowing soldiers, could you gain that if you weren't, you weren't disloyal like these four guys, but you didn't want to go to the army, or you didn't want to, and you hear about the 620th, where you can stay in South Dakota, go to Deadwood on Friday night, and spend the war chopping wood. You know, well, there are people that would make that choice. My grandfather, Charlie Walden, he was the man that made Fort Meade work. He was the paymaster. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> and the merchants of dead would thank him. <laughs> You're gonna, we talked earlier about that picture. You are going to say something about the picture on the table. Oh, Dodi, please tell us the oh. picture about oh, how that came to be. About the picture, right? <laughs> Probably the best picture that was ever taken of Bob. Um, you remember Dick Kettlehall that used to work at the Journal, the photographer? You'd see his byline under pictures, how good he was. I don't know where he is now. He's still, uh, what? still working. Still working. Yeah. Yes. Well, he and another re and a reporter came to the to the house in Wilbur Canyon where we lived to interview Bob. And I don't, sad to say, I don't remember who the reporter was. But boy, was I excited to meet Dick Kettle. I just thought I was floating. But anyway, he came in, and you could see Bob was in that, what was his study. And uh, Dick was going to take his picture, and Bob was telling him, of course, Bob's a photographer too, he's telling Dick what. Finally, I stepped in and I said, Bob, that's Dick Kettlewell, the photographer. Do what he tells you to do. <laughs> and, he got, and he got this big grin on his face and Dick took the picture. <laughs> just like the, the best picture that ever got taken. <laughs> 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 And for those of you that, that want to, I'll conclude here, for those of you that want to learn more or, or just hear or read Bob's voice again, uh, the archives of the, of the paper that are available in microfilm uh, have just an endless, you know, through the course of his decades as a journalist, Bob wrote the equivalent of a, a wow. whole bookcase full of <laughs> words. <laughs> Things are a little different in the newspapers now, but there was certainly a time when the, uh, when the editor wrote a, an editorial every week or every uh, issue, and when they did this, Sturgis Tribune, Black Hills Press, and Tricep Livestock News, Bob wrote three editorials every week on the opinion page, and that's where he kept his opinion. And sometimes I think about how many times he sat down and did that. That's the other thing. One time when I was sitting in the front office, uh, I was, he was in his office, and I was looking, and he was sitting in front of me, 
at the time. His typewriter. Okay. You see. <laughs> He's looking. And I'm thinking, what? And he keeps doing it. You see, it's like, because he did use to <laughs> Oh. There's no way he went. He brought it out in the way he went. <laughs> Well, okay. yes. I don't know if all of you know this, but we have a historian here. We are very happy that Dodie is still here. She's 95 years young as of yesterday. Oh. Oh. I love that young. Yeah. <laughs> Hang in there. Yeah, Brenda gave me the best card. It says, um, Oh, wise one, how come you have lived so long? You turn the page and the wise one says, I can just keep breathing. <laughs> so we'll give it a try. Well, thank you all for being here today. Uh, as next fall, next fall, this program restarts, uh, hopefully in the library. I, well, Julie yep. thinks we're going to be back in the new, new uh, conference room. By the time fall, so that'll be exciting.